Hey everyone, Wes here. Welcome back to another Design Patterns video. In this video, we're going to take a look at the Abstract Factory Pattern. So this is a creational pattern and throughout this series, we're looking at actually all of the design patterns that are covered in the Gang of Four Design Patterns book with modern examples using C Sharp and realistic dependencies and food related business logic. So there is a separate program and separate code for each of the patterns in this book in a GitHub repo. So be sure to check that out if you're interested in following along with the code in this video. So we're going to dive into this creational pattern, this abstract factory pattern. And I want to put it out there that this pattern introduces a significant amount of complexity on top of a typical factory method pattern. So if you're not already familiar with the factory method pattern, I covered this in a previous video. I would definitely recommend getting familiar with motivations for a factory method before moving on to uh, really trying to wrap your head around the abstract factory pattern. The abstract factory pattern occurs in special use cases, I'll say, or specific use cases when we need to think about uh, the creation of multiple families of objects. So whereas a factory method pattern basically provides us with a way to isolate the creational logic uh, from client code and really have our clients be loosely coupled with the concrete types that a factory might create. The abstract factory pattern is going to introduce an additional level of abstraction, uh, which is going to enable us to create entire factories that create families of products. And in this way, we can not only sort of decouple our client code from our creational logic and provide that same level of loose coupling, um, but this may be particularly useful in cases when uh, we need to make sure that entire families of objects uh, collaborate well, that they're compatible with each other, and that our software needs to be extensible along the dimension of these families. So one of the things that we always want to think about in general with design patterns, particularly some of these more complex patterns, is the trade-offs between the added complexity and the benefits that the patterns bring. And typically, the benefits that the patterns bring is really along some particular dimension of extensibility. And what I mean by that is that it's going to make it really easy for us to make our software extensible in certain ways. Uh, and with the abstract factory pattern, it's going to make it really easy for us to create new families of related products. But it wouldn't be the first creational pattern that you'd pick up if you just need to, for instance, separate uh, your client logic from your creational logic. So a lot of times more complex creational patterns like the abstract factory pattern evolve naturally out of um, out of business logic that might use something simpler like a factory method. So I want to sort of proceed with that caveat that this is a pattern that is um, that can introduce more complexity than it's worth in certain cases. And we always need to be thinking about design and the trade-offs uh, when we look to implement these patterns. All right, so speaking of implementing these patterns, let's take a closer look at the definition. We'll take a quick look at the UML and then we'll dive right into a real world example. Let's dive in and take a look at the abstract factory pattern in a bit more detail. So the abstract factory is a creational pattern that provides an interface for creating families of related or dependent objects without specifying their concrete classes. So let's break this down a little bit. So first of all, we're going to be dealing with this as a creational pattern. And we know from looking at other creational patterns that this means we're basically concerned with the instantiation of new objects. And here we're going to be providing an interface for creating families of related or dependent objects. Interface here is used in the most general sense. This is the sense that I think the, the gang of four authors would use it. Uh, basically, we mean that it's going to provide an abstraction for this behavior. Uh, we could implement that certainly as a C-sharp interface or maybe an abstract base class, as we'll see in a bit. Um, but when we see the term interface as used a lot of times in uh, Gang of Four Design patterns, uh, basically we mean we're providing an, a high-level abstraction uh, for some behavior. So we're going to be providing this abstraction for creating families of related or dependent objects 
without specifying their concrete classes. So this notion that we're creating families of related or dependent objects is really what distinguishes the abstract factory pattern, uh, perhaps from the other creational patterns. Uh, so it's really going to be most useful in situations where we, first of all, have families of related or dependent objects, uh, but also uh, in particular use cases where we may need to extend our software to include new families of related objects in the future. Um, so as is, uh, as I tend to mention a lot throughout this series, we should always be thinking really hard about the particular motivations and the trade-offs of each design pattern when we are learning them. Uh, that way when we see them in the wild or when we run into a particular situation that might call for them, we can be aware of uh, not only the, the uh, benefits that they might provide us with, but also some of the drawbacks. So in this case, uh, this particular creational pattern, the abstract factory, is going to tend to only be useful uh, when we have situations where we have these families of related objects. Um, and we may want to extend our software along that particular dimension. It's actually going to make it um, uh, somewhat difficult actually to extend along other dimensions when this uh, particular pattern is implemented and so stay tuned towards uh, the implementation details part of the video uh, when we take a look at that. Uh, finally it's going to be able to do this without specifying their concrete classes. Okay well this makes sense this is in part sort of the motivation for uh, factories in general our client code is going to be able to work with abstractions and be written against an interface or be written against behavior as opposed to implementations. Um, and in general, that is a high level concept that really makes our, uh, our software more loosely coupled. Um, and we can think about that uh, really concretely because we can say like, okay, we want to, uh, we have some abstract implementation, let's say a C-sharp interface. We know we can write any number of implementations against that interface. And then our client side code can be uh, written to depend only on the interface as opposed to those concretions. And so we should be able to write and swap out the concrete implementations of such an interface um, at the latest possible moment. So that goes into the whole concept of late binding um, and really being able to use polymorphism to our benefit um, so that we can uh, write against interfaces as opposed to against implementations. In a general sense, this pattern is gonna be useful in situations where we have these groupings of objects, similar objects that might belong to a family, as was mentioned in the last slide. And we can use it to avoid tight coupling, between client code and concrete products and ensure products from any given factory are compatible. Okay, so there is one significant drawback here. I did talk about it very briefly. This design pattern can introduce a, uh, some significant complexity over say a basic factory method. So as always with every design pattern that we work with, we wanna design with care and we wanna understand uh, the intention and the way that we expect our software to grow before we just sort of cherry pick a design pattern and uh, wire it up into our software thinking that it's going to solve all of our problems. Uh, with uh, some of the more complex design patterns like the abstract factory, uh, often the complexity actually isn't worth the benefit, um, but it's just worth knowing uh, sort of where that, uh, when that line needs to be crossed, when the additional complexity and indirection actually do benefit us, um, in this case, maybe because of the way that our software uh, grows or changes over time. All right, so here is the standard abstract factory UML diagram. Uh, this is the one that is presented, or at least very similar to the one that's presented in the Gang of Four book. Uh, basically following the same conventions that I followed with the other design patterns videos. Um, so in yellow here, we have C-sharp interfaces um, with the dotted line around them and uh, what we're saying here is that we have some client code that has an iAbstract Factory interface or it makes use of one. And it also makes use of abstract product A and iAbstract product B. These are also interfaces. And our abstract factories have ways to create different products. So abstract factories can create product A and product B. These abstract factories themselves can of course have different implementations. So we have these concrete classes 
which are uh, implementations of the iabstract factory. So concrete factory one here is just a class that implements this interface. And it has its own way of creating a concrete product A and a concrete product B. And we can see that the uh, concrete products A and B, uh, they themselves are uh, written against interfaces abstract product A and abstract product B. So we have two concrete factories, two implementations of our abstract factory, each of which create concrete products of type A and type B. And our client, which makes use of these particular products, uh, works with them through an interface. So uh, it doesn't, it basically doesn't matter what concrete type they become. Um, the client can work with the abstract factory and any implementation of that factory can create concrete products A and B, which our client can then also make use of. Notice that our client only makes use of uh, interfaces basically. Um, it only, it's only written against abstractions as opposed to concrete implementations. And what this provides us with is the ability to create new implementations of our abstract factory, new concretions, without changing our client code. So our software is going to be really extensible along that dimension of uh, particular implementations of our abstract factory. Um, where it's going to be less extensible, as we'll see, is if we needed to create new types of products. So we can see that if we were to introduce a product C here, and all of a sudden every factory needed a way to create a product C, and we would actually need to update our interface, and uh, in doing that, we need to create implementations for uh, product C in every implementation of our factories as well. So in that sense, uh, this pattern can introduce uh, some additional complexity uh, that might warrant looking for other solutions if our uh, if our software tends to want to extend or change along the direction of the types of concrete products we have, as opposed to uh, the particular types of families we have, each of which contain a very slowly changing, let's say, number of products. Okay, so let's take a look at the diagram for the way that I've written the example code. Uh, basically, we have client code here, and the idea is that we have a meal plan application that we provide our, our uh, customers with uh, basically gro things like grocery lists, um, maybe uh, some recipes and that sort of thing. And in doing that, we provide sort of the same base types of products to our customers, um, but they have uh, very distinct groupings or families of the types of products that we provide. So in this case, that dimension might be the customer's diet. So we have a meal plan factory interface, which can generate a menu and generate a shopping list. And it's implemented as a keto meal plan factory for like a, a ketogenic diet or a vegetarian meal plan factory for a vegetarian diet. And you can imagine that as new diets come along in the future, which of course seems like there's a new diet every few months or every year, uh, our software is going to be really extensible along that dimension, assuming that it doesn't really matter what the client's diet is. We're always going to be giving them a menu and a shopping list and that sort of thing. So our iMeal Plan Factory is implemented by our two concrete factories, Keto Meal Plan Factory and Vegetarian Meal Plan Factory and they each generate their own concrete versions of a particular product, namely a menu and a shopping list. Our client works with those objects uh, in, the, in an abstract form, in the form of interfaces. So our client just works with menus and shopping lists, each of which themselves have high-level be behavior defined on them, uh, which may be implemented differently depending on the particular concretion. So there's a keto menu and a vegetarian menu, and the keto menu is going to return, you know, uh, menu items which are ketogenic in nature, and the vegetarian menu isn't going to have meat on it, for instance, uh, and then some very similar type of behavior that you can imagine for a shopping list. So our families in this case are really diet, and the uh, sort of logical grouping of objects within those families are things like menus and shopping lists. And then crucially, as was mentioned, uh, 
the client is working with abstractions. It's working with an interface uh, for not only the abstract factory itself here, uh, which is why it would be called an abstract factory, um, but also with interfaces for the menu and the shopping list as well. It's a little bit easier to visualize uh, with color here, I think. So when our client basically in some form or another, whether or not it's through configuration or through some user input, decides that it needs uh, to uh, work with a vegetarian diet, it's basically going to be able to uh, wire up a vegetarian meal plan factory as the particular implementation. Uh, we know we can do that at runtime thanks to dynamic polymorphism um, and, and uh, basically bind that implementation at the latest possible moment. Um, so that the client code itself never really needs to change uh, with regards to, to the particular implementation of uh, such objects. So our vegetarian meal plan factory is going to create our vegetarian menu and our vegetarian shopping list. Our client is never really going to be aware of the particular type it's dealing with. As far as its code is concerned, it's just dealing with menus and shopping lists and something that can generate them for it. Likewise, if we wired it up to uh, use the keto meal plan factory, we would just be using the other part of this graph. We'd be using the uh, keto meal plan factory and its particular implementations. All right, so I think that's enough diagramming. Let's go ahead and dive into the code and look at the real world example of this uh, meal plan factory. All right, so here we are in our program. As with all of the examples throughout this series, we have a C-sharp console application. Uh, you can find this one in the solution under the example programs, creational examples, and then our custom meal planner console app. So as always, we have a program.c-sharp file here, and we see that we have a single method main. What we're gonna do is we're basically going to create our dependencies here. This is the highest level of our application. And so any particular implementations of dependencies we have will be defined here. So in a sense, this is sort of our composition root uh, in sort of DI terms or dependency injection terms here. So we're going to log out our customer email and we're, well, rather we're going to uh, ask our customer to provide their email, and then we're gonna read that into a variable here, customer email. So if it's null or white space, we're just going to return, and basically uh, everything is done. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to move into this try catch block, in which we are going to reach out to a database here, given that customer email input, and we're going to get some type of diet type back just as a, a string here. We could take a look at what this is doing. So this method is just a simple static method and it's just sort of a, a simple uh, mock implementation of getting some diet from a database. Basically, if the customer provide, pr provided email is jane at example.com, it's gonna return the string keto, otherwise it's gonna return the string vegetarian. So this is sort of our mock database. We're basically just saying, okay, if you're Jane, I'm gonna give you a string keto, otherwise I'm gonna give you a string vegetarian. So then our variable meal plan factory gets created and we assign this to the output of get factory for diet type. Here we're passing in that string and then we're also passing our logger dependency which we're going to share throughout the uh, execution path here. So we're not going to create more than one logger here. We're just going to pass our dependencies uh, to these methods. So get factory for diet type, we can take a look at that. So here we really have the uh, sort of the key moment in which we are uh, effectively providing the concretion that we're going to work with, uh, whether it's the keto meal plan factory or that vegetarian meal plan factory. Uh, the reason that we pass our logger as an interface is that both factories to have the logger as a dependency. So we're going to wire that in here. So if we get the string keto, we're going to return the keto meal plan factory. Otherwise with uh, the vegetarian string, we'll return the vegetarian meal plan factory. Otherwise we have a default to return the vegetarian meal plan factory. Okay, uh, crucially here, we should notice that what we're actually returning from this method uh, is the 
interface eye meal plan factory, of which the keto meal plan factory and vegetarian meal plan factory each implement. So we'll take a look at those here in a moment, but it's very important to note that this method, this get factory for diet type, its return type here is just the interface I meal plan factory. So it doesn't matter uh, for the caller of get factory for diet type, the concrete implementation, as long as the uh, concretion here that gets returned implements this interface, uh, everything's good as far as the client's, as far as the client's concerned. So we come back up here, we have now our factory for the diet type. Notice if we take a look at the IntelliSense here, we can see that as far as this client side code is concerned, of course we're working with anything that implements our iMeal plan factory. We have another uh, dependency here, so this is just an implementation detail. We have an emailer, um, which takes our logger as a dependency, and we have a meal plan service, which is going to take anything that implements iMeal Plan Factory. So it takes that interface here as well as the emailer and a logger. So we'll take a look at that momentarily as well. So ultimately from this service we are going to send our meal plans to our subscriber using their email address. So we take the email in, we use that to get some static data back from our database, in this case just the form of some string. Based on that string our client knows how to go fetch some particular implementation of one of our factories via this abstract factory, this interface that we have. And then we have some service object here that's able to sort of put all those pieces together. We're able to use that factory that we have and an emailer and a logger to complete all of our business logic to basically send that user uh, their particular menu and anything else associated with their diet plan. But as far as our client code is concerned, we, uh, we are only dealing with uh, interfaces in our business logic. Okay, so let's take a look first of all at the factories themselves and then we'll also dive in and take a look at this meal plan service and what's happening there when we send a meal plan to our subscriber. So for that, uh, we can head down into our creational patterns uh, class library and then under abstract factory, we have a, a namespace for our meal plan factories. Uh, so we have our keto meal plan factory. This implements our interface, I meal plan factory. We can take a look at that. Basically, this just says uh, to implement this, we need an object that generates an I menu, generate lunches menu, generates an I menu, generate desserts menu, and then generates an I shopping list via generates shopping list. So as long as our particular concrete factories implement this abstract interface, if you will, this uh, this C-sharp interface, iMeal Plan Factory, um, then our client code can continue to work as expected. So we have two implementations. We have our Keto Meal Plan Factory. Uh, we can see it has a constructor with a logger, and then it has its own way to return iMenu interfaces. Again, the menus themselves are defined uh, against the interfaces, and so the Keto Meal Plan Factory generates a Keto Dessert menu, uh, a Keto Lunch menu, and a Keto Shopping List. Okay, so if we take a look now in Meal Plans, and we come down here under Keto and Vegetarian, each has its own separate namespace where it has implementations of each of these iMenus and iShopping List interfaces. So we have our Dessert menu, uh, which can print a description and print the menu, our lunch menu, our shopping list, and then we have a separate implementation here for the vegetarian option. So if we just kind of take a look at the project structure for something like this, we can see that we have namespaces for the factories. Uh, so if we need to implement a new implementation, let's say of a say slow carb meal plan factory, we would add that here to this namespace. Uh, we would just need to make sure that, of course, it uh, implemented iMeal Plan Factory. And then we would create a completely new namespace for the meal plan and put the concrete implementations of the dessert menu and the lunch menu and the shopping list uh, in that particular namespace. So I think things stay can stay pretty organized in that regard. Um, we'll talk about the drawbacks here in a moment. So we can see our interfaces here. Uh, basically, I just keep these at the level of the abstract factory namespace. Then our meal plan service that I mentioned we take a look at. 
this is mostly an implementation detail. This is just basically how all of the pieces come together to perform some specific piece of business logic, which in our case is sending a meal plan to some subscriber. So this gets called all the way back up from our client in the console app where we take in that subscriber email, and we do some logging here, uh, and then we uh, use our factory to generate the lunch, dessert, and uh, shopping list. Lunch menu, dessert menu, and shopping list. And we can see that those get passed as dependencies uh, via constructor injection here, if you will. Um, basically, we are uh, just passing the dependencies we need as interfaces to the meal plan service. This lets our meal plan service itself also work with any implementation of not only the meal plan factory, which is the subject of this video, but also any other of its dependencies. So something that sends emails and something that writes logs. Okay, so all that this meal plan service is responsible for is taking all of that uh, behavior and essentially uh, forcing it to collaborate to send a meal plan to a subscriber. So it generates the menus and the shopping list. It does some logging. It uses the behavior that's defined on those particular objects, like printing the menu description and the entire menu itself, making the shopping list. Um, and then sending some email. So it's doing quite a lot here, um, but for the purposes of demonstration, the idea here is that we have a, an additional collaborator in the mix here that basically takes our, our, uh, the products from our factory and our, the factories themselves actually, um, and uses those products to do something useful, like log or send an email. Okay, so Let's talk about the drawbacks really quickly. We can see that it would be really easy here, I think, to extend our application along the dimension of diet, uh, which is the motivation for the fact abstract factory um, in the sense that we're talking about collections of objects that belong to particular families. So I could create a new meal plan factory, as mentioned, for like the slow carb diet or whatever else that we have, vegan diet or something like that. We could put those in here and it's very simple, it's very extensible. We don't need to change any other code. We don't need to change the meal plan service, for instance, if we just want to add a new diet. Um, presumably, the, uh, we have some way for a customer to sign up and assign themselves some particular diet. We know that in our client side code, uh, this just gets uh, keyed on as a string. So this could be anything. It's just some static data that exists in the world has no notion of the downstream type that's going to get created um, based on its value. So in that sense, we have a very extensible structure along that dimension of object family. Where this pattern kind of works against us is imagine that uh, per family, we have some new particular type of product to create and uh, that, that has its own behavior. So right now we have menus and shopping lists. Let's imagine that our software changes a lot in terms of the particular features that we offer per diet or on a diet basis. So let's say we also um, per diet provide some type of eating schedule, let's say, or um, any number of other things that might be associated with, uh, with a particular diet. So if we did that, we'd need to create a new interface for that object, and then every diet that we have an implementation for, we would need to write a method for in its concrete factory. So this is not particularly extensible. We have, we have to go in, and we're not creating new files here. We have to open up the existing concrete factories and write new implementations for those new objects that now become part of the family, if you will. And so that is one thing that you want to think about here. I think in terms of complexity, uh, this pattern is already fairly complex as it is, although we can see its benefit in terms of extensibility and loose coupling um, in certain ways. If our application grows in other ways, then uh, this pattern essentially buys us nothing for all of that additional complexity. So let's imagine now that there are only two diets in the world, or only two diets that our application will ever be concerned with, and we never plan to change along that dimension. 
but we do plan on having lots of different types of products associated with those diets, say like a schedule. We're going to constantly have to be coming into these classes to add that behavior to both of these diets. This would get even worse, let's say, if there were, say, 12 diets themselves, which never changed, um, but whose features and whose actual products changed, as was mentioned, because then we're going into those 12 concrete factories every time we want to add a single new product uh, that that factory can create and get added to the family. So definitely worth thinking about and uh, sort of understanding those trade-offs before we rush out to just use the abstract factory, I would say. Um, definitely think about the ways that your software is intended or expected to change, um, as always. And yeah, uh, the abstract factory, very interesting pattern. Pretty nice way, I think, to deal with the particular type of situation that we might have like this, uh, where we may have uh, families of objects that change over time. Um, but of course it comes with its drawback. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you got anything out of it, I'd really appreciate it if you liked and subscribed for the next Design Patterns video, which should be coming shortly. It's good seeing you, and I'll see you in the next video.